We hope you had a nice lunch. And now let me announce the first speaker of the afternoon session, Dr. Garav Jaiswal from Technical University of Denmark. Dr. Jaiswal will talk about the highlights from observations of X-ray binaries with NICER. Dr. Jaiswal, can you hear me? Yeah, sure, I can hear you. Thanks. Can okay, you hear me? Now, yes, of course. And now I leave the microphone to you, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see. Okay, thanks. So my name is Gaurav Jaiswal and uh, I am a postdoc at uh, National Space Institute, DTU Space Denmark. Uh, I am working with NISA team almost since its launch. And then it's going to be almost four years because it will launch in June, 2017. So I will be sharing today some of the results from NISA mission, uh, especially on the neutron star X-ray binary where I have worked, collaborated and uh, laid some of the results. So uh, when we say NISA, what do you mean by NISA? NISA stands for the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. It was launched in June, 3rd June, 2017. And then uh, it is a payload attached to the International Space Station. So almost the uh, mid-July, it started working for the science program. So this is the like picture of how NISA looks like uh, on International Space Station. So NICER uh, has uh, mainly one payload that is uh, known as X-ray timing instrument, that is XTI. And you can imagine that uh, how in the real life it looks like uh, from the one of the uh, picture here, where the one portion is standing just next to the NICER. And uh, the, this is the main instrument. Uh, it's, it has the total uh, 56 concentrator optics. It has con concentrator optics, and uh, these, these are made by 24 nested foils on the parabolical foils, uh, which act as a concentrator for X-ray. Uh, it concentrated the X-ray photons mainly in soft X-ray domain, and then uh, uh, sent it to the, it's detected by a solid uh, device detector. And, and we see that we detect the uh, almost each and every photon from the stellar X-ray sources. So there are total uh, 56 XRT instrument, XT, sorry, XTI instrument on the NICER, among which uh, currently uh, 52 are actively working. So uh, in terms of capabilities, as I say that uh, it is a soft X-ray instrument, it mainly works in 0.2 to 12, KV uh, range. Uh, it is really marvelous instrument for the neutron star studies. Uh, we also studied a different kind of transient sources, including black hole and uh, other transients. But uh, the the soft X-ray range well matches perfect for the neutron star emissions. It also overlap with the previous instruments and also the currently active uh, missions like XMM and Newton, XMM, Newton and Chandra. Uh, it has a timing resolution in terms of in terms of capabilities. It has a timing resolution of 0.1 microsecond, uh, which is better than 50 times better than RXT and almost 100 times better than XMM, Newton. It has a good spectral sensitivity, uh, less than 150 electron volt at 6 keV. So as you see that it has a tremendous qualities and uh, that's why it is one of the best instrument we can say that's uh, currently uh, active. Uh, in terms of effective area, it, it corresponds to uh, around 1900 centimeters square at one keV, which is far more better than uh, XMM Newton uh, around one keV. Uh, the one of the another amazing thing is that uh, with we can really see that uh, how the NICER is actively working in this space. So it it is looking to the stars, different stars, but we can also see the how our instrument is working at the moment. So that is the one of the marvelous uh, point of this mission. 
anyway uh, in terms of uh, the nicer uh, this is the nicer science team this slide is old uh, from october 2019 but you can see that the, around that time we had more than 80 uh, researchers from all across globe the nicer science team had and uh, these uh, researchers are uh, uh, working in the different uh, zones especially towards the neutron star uh, science exploring the different kind of neutron star sources in the binary isolated neutron stars uh, something happening on the dynamics on the neutron star surface of uh, these these different kind of studies and uh, we with the nice we also study uh, the other kind of transients belonging to the black hole or any other active sources with the NISA. So uh, why? I, till now, I have mentioned that NISA is a wonderful instrument for the neutron stars, but why neutron stars? Why we are uh, so much interested for neutron star that uh, a special instrument has been sent to the space? What is the purpose of that? So in terms of neutron star, they serve a very exotic class of the sources. And I, why I say exotic that uh, they have uh, 1.4 solar mass and uh, it's uh, with just its radius within the 10 to 14 kilometers, it's a city size object that makes it so exotic. If we simply calculate that uh, if a source has a mass of one point, more than 1.4 solar mass and uh, it just condense into a very tiny radii, 10 to 14 kilometer, what is the density? So M by V, we can calculate the density and that density comes, tremendous density, it means it comes uh, the nuclear material density, order of 10 to power 12 Gauss. So this is a, like a picture for how uh, the neutron star interior profile is looks like, or it is expected how it looks like. So. So for example, that uh, at the very beginning of like on the crust, upper outer crust side, we can see the density could be 10 to power 11 gram per centimeter cube. But as we probe little bit inside, the theoretical expectation said that it's a density rises. And then at the interior means at the core, it becomes so much dense. It may exceed the nuclear material density. It may be the super fluid, uh, some, some, something like that. There, there are many, many theoretical speculations. We say that uh, how how the uh, interior profile of neutron star could be. So, so with the nicer, one of the fundamental question is that apart from studying the outer aspect of neutron star, how the interior profile of neutron star looks like. Currently, we have uh, n number of uh, equation of a state. When I say equation of a state, it means that uh, how the density and pressure uh, as we probe inside the neutron star is changes. So, so we have a number of equation of a state and each equation of a state gives the two uh, macro observables, which means that uh, for each mathematical equation of neutron star, we can uh, get ultimately the two observable properties, which is the mass and radius. So that is the beautiful thing of equation of a state. So if we somehow if we may, can measure the mass of neutron star and also measure the radius of the neutron star, which can solve this long standing problem in the neutron star physics, which means the what is the real equation of a state of these objects. So uh, in this direction, means uh, we have some constraint on the mass of the neutron star, but we really, have some idea the radius could be around 12 kilometers, 14 kilometers, or 20 kilometers. This is the sum number, means the, and, uh, and depending on the equation of a state pictures, these numbers, like whether you say 12 or 14, it changes from the one equation of a state to one another equation of a state. So that is the one of the puzzle. Like if we like to pinpoint that this is the real nature of the material within the neutron star. Uh, so this will be your equation, means how, how the mathematically, how, how the physically the source looks like. Uh, the one of the like important point, as I said that, uh, uh, they are a very tiny object. They have a temperature of around 10 to the power six Kelvin. 
and in terms of uh, uh, magnetic field they are extremely exotic object means uh, they have magnetic field minimum is starting from 10 to power 8 gauss and going up to 10 to power 15 gauss in the lab at max we have achieved on the earth in the terrestrial lab, we have almost achieved up to some Tesla label, which is 10 to about four Gauss, but nothing on this label. So the studying the neutron star also makes something very important in the terms like we want to understand the how the electron, proton, or the real material behaves in such exotic magnetic field or in such density or temperature. So that makes these objects quite um exotic in that sense uh if i move just further that i if i try to say that why nicer how the nicer is contributing in this aspect so so as i mentioned that uh, the radii is important uh, holy grail for the neutron star physics means we want to uh identify or quantify what is the real radius of neutron star and the um, major time of nicer is uh, is uh, spared in this direction means uh, we means the nicer team is observing large number of neutron stars uh, whether in the isolated or x-ray binary systems or different different kind of like sources within the neutron stars we observe different neutron star kind of neutron stars to just constrain uh, the radius of these sources. So the very first suspect we can constrain the radius just by uh, just by uh, observing the pulse, which is emission coming from the neutron star, and just doing this pulse modulation, how the pulse is coming. If we can model just by the help of general relativity, we can say that uh, what uh, it would be its radius means the gravitational effect on the emission and then we can translate back to the what it would be its radius the 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 precision should be less than 5 to 10% error bar uh, if we can uh, determine better than 5 to 10% within the error bar we can say that uh, uh, this will help us to do go back with the equation of a state aspect uh, in ca any case uh, apart from modeling the pulse profile we can have a different method by measuring the radii and the, the sum of the method comes through uh, through the observing the neutron star sources in x-ray binary. So for example, I mentioned somewhere that x-ray binaries and uh, what these objects are, you have heard the previous talks and uh, there were some uh, descriptions on the different kind of neutron stars and uh, other sources. So I will just briefly go through the x-ray binary aspect. Uh, X-ray binary means the first word keyword is the binary means we are talking about the two objects, it's a binary. And when we put the X-ray means we are talking about the, the systems from which a binary systems from which we observe the X-ray. So that is the X-ray binary. Uh, when I add the one extra word, the neutron star, it means the neutron star X-ray binary. It means the one of the object is the neutron star uh, in the system and we are ob observing the X-ray from the system. So, so these, a cartoon, this is a cartoon of uh, X-ray binary. It means that uh, there is a star uh, which is giving material to the another star. And this another object is nothing but a neutron star, which is which is, has the enormous uh, gravitational energy. And uh, there is a transfer of material from one star to another star. And this material is accreting towards the compact object and giving us the X-ray. So this system is called the X-ray binary. So for example, in X-ray binary systems, we have a different kind of uh, uh, classes. For example, in some of the X-ray binary, we observe the thermonuclear burst. It, it basically happens in the low mass X-ray binary system where, at, as I told you, there is the two object. One is the compact object, which is neutron star. And then we are talking about the second star. Depending on the mass of the second star, we can classify the X-ray binary in two classes. If the, the counterpart, the optical companion, is uh, less than three solar mass. This becomes comes into the category of low mass X-ray binary. But uh, if the mass is greater than ten solar mass, then it becomes the high mass X-ray binary. So, so thermonuclear bursts are is usually observed in the low mass X-ray binary. Uh, you will be hearing about more 
the low mass X-ray binary, especially thermonuclear burst by Tolga in the next talk. But I will be covering a little bit about uh, some of the aspect of the thermonuclear X-ray burst in this talk. So here you can see that uh, there is a star which is giving material to a compact object, which is neutron star. Neutron star, as I told you, it's a 10 to 12 kilometer uh, radii object. It has a stellar surface. So material coming onto the surface, they, they, they pile up on the surface and when certain critical condition attains, uh, these material starts burning. These materials are mostly uh, hydrogen and helium. And then, then thermal, thermal, thermonuclear uh, runaway process happens and it emits the X-ray emission. So we see suddenly that uh, if we observe the sources for a certain time uh, in X-ray band, we see that there is a persistent emission. And then suddenly out of nowhere, we see the spike, a thermonuclear burst, like a spike going up and then coming down. So, so this is like uh, uh, the sum of the event happens in the low mass X-ray band. So this, the thermonuclear X-ray burst. So as I told you that uh, the, there are, uh, X-ray burst, type one X-ray burst, uh, which looks like there is a persistent part and then sudden something is shooting up and then going down. So these are the X-ray burst. Uh, how do we know that these are the X-ray burst? We have to do the detailed analysis about the sources. We have to do some timing and the spectral aspect to determine that these are the real X-ray burst. Because as I told that uh, the simple idea uh, there is something nuclear burning happening on the neutron star surface. And the, when the pure nuclear burning happens, it means that it's uh, something is burning means the neutron star becomes a hot ball. And uh, when it becomes a hot ball, you know that uh, the, the temperature should be the black body temperature because it's a, something is hot. So, so just, we can, just by doing the spectroscopy, we can say that whether these are thermonuclear bursts or not. And then uh, we can follow up in detail. So if I go in this sources, uh, we have the material coming onto the neutron star piling up and then hydrogen and helium are the mainly material. And when the critical condition occurs, they, there starts the nuclear burning and we see the X-ray flashes. So, so you can see the, among all three cartoons, the how the thermonuclear burst process happens on these sources. So, I will be just uh, sharing the some uh, very first result with the NICER, how NICER contributed uh, towards the uh, aspect of uh, X-ray bursts. So for example, uh, there was a, a paper by Lawrence Kick. He, he worked on the Equilo X1 and we observed a very moderate burst, means the sub Eddington burst from Equilo X1, this source. And uh, you can imagine the potential of the NICER mission that this burst is sub Eddington burst uh, and it recorded around 3000 counts in the NICER band. So 3000 counts at just for a fraction of second, we are seeing something is going a spike up and then coming down. So this is the burst. Uh, we performed the detail analysis. The one of the most amazing thing for this burst, we found that uh, uh, as I, as I told that, for example, sorry, just a moment. As I told that there is a persistent part and then something is coming up and then going wrong. We are calling this, uh, this is a burst, this is a thermal part. Ideally it should be thermal. So uh, this is the thermal part and this is the persistent part. Persistent part means it's a coming from the accretion processes uh, happening from the accretion disk around it, the X-ray coming from it. So. So this, this accretion part, this, uh, this persistent part, uh, it should be non-thermal. It is expected to be non-thermal because there are different processes happening close to the neutron star uh, in the accretion disk. So it is expected to be non-thermal emission at the mixture of, uh, but this burst part should be expected to uh, thermal because it's a hot ball happening on the neutron star surface. So we see the X-ray emission, the pre-burst emission, you can see the blue points are the pre-burst emission and there is burst emission. So uh, what we did, we try to understand through the spectroscope, what is the nature of spectral emission from this burst. And uh, apart from the thermal part, we realized that uh, there is something excess 
means if we subtract the pre-burst emission, there's something like some kind of excess in, in the soft X-ray. Uh, you can see in the residual panel on the first uh, panel uh, downwards, you can see that there is some excess is respect to pre-burst. And this pre-burst uh, means this excess can be defined by just uh, manipulating the persistent level by certain uh, factor or if we add the disk reflection. So this was the one of the very uh, nice result that even we are observing a sub intent kind of burst, we, with the nicer like instrument, we can detect this the disk reflection processes uh, among the burst sources. It means that uh, the disk reflection in the sense, in the science wise, if I say that when the burst occurs, the photons, the burst photon, the thermal photons have chance to interact with the uh, environment of neutron star and the, where is the disk and everything. So these photons get reprocessed and then they again collected in, within the softer side. So there is a reprocessing happening. So by the time resolved spectroscopy, we see the cooling of uh, the black body temperature. So we know that this is a burst emission and we obtain some of the spectral parameter. I will not go into detail of it. Uh, with NICER, we also observed one of the source, uh, the 4U1820-30, uh, and we observed the thermonuclear burst from these sources. So, so if, if I just go back in terms of uh, radii aspect, even with using the thermonuclear burst, we can constrain the radii, the neutron star radii, because there is something oddball happening, and we know the black body equation, we know the source distance, if we, if we, we can very well constrain that with Gaia and other instruments. So if we can know the other systematic uncertainty, we can say that, okay, this is the radius, but there is a problem because with the thermonuclear burst, whatever the radii we collect, uh, whatever the radii we estimate is, is affected by systematic errors. And depending on the how the hot spot means the burning processing on the neutron star surface, the radii could vary and there could be a different contributing factor, like for example, the atmosphere of the neutron star, which affect the radiation ultimately, uh, this radii constant will not be very much accurate. So so the, so the this, for example, the second uh, example by again, the Lawrence Kick, Lawrence Kick work where he worked on the 4U8 in 2030, we observed, uh, uh, we observed multiple thermonuclear bursts from 4U1820, but the one of the example is here. Uh, this source, briefly about the source, this source has a very uh, unique characteristics. It is expected to show uh, burst in a specific uh, low hard state. And, and we, this low hard state almost appears uh, every six months in the source. So we know that uh, there could be the thermonuclear burst and uh, with NICER, we cast some of the thermonuclear bursts. Uh, for example, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the, the one of the bursts we observed close to the peak count rate was close to the 25,000. And uh, in the soft X-ray band and in the hard X-ray band, if, if we see the three to nine KV, we saw the, some kind of peculiar feature at the peak, which is which we define the double peak like, like a structure in X-ray burst where the most of the short photon are missed by earlier era mission, for example, RXT or other missions. So this is ideally matches what is expected with the RXT profile and NICER profile. So we did the time visual spectroscopy of this burst and we found a, a strong expansion burst means the, the burst was so strong, the burning on the neutron star surface was so strong that the neutron star photosphere almost extended about 200 kilometers above the neutron star surface. So that was the really amazing finding uh, from the NICER. Uh, the one of the very, very interesting aspect uh, where, where which could directly contribute to the estimation of the radii from neutron star is, is by this study, uh, or maybe if we can pursue the future, the similar kind of a study with, uh, uh, with the nicer or maybe more spectral resolution, highly resolution instrument. So for example, uh, uh, during the burst, we expect that uh, there is a nuclear thermal reaction going on. And uh, in this process, there may be possibility that high 
high high isotopic elements get formed onto the surface and and when the element form on the surface because of the photoionization with uh, these elements we expect there could be some uh, absorption like ages from from uh, which is coming from the neutron star surface. So this is one of the study, early study by Stomayer et al, where uh, we found the three features from thermonuclear burst. These were the, these bursts where they stacked all together to uh, attain the more signal to noise ratio. So we got something close to one KV with uh, emission like feature. We got something close to the 1.7 and three KV, which was absorption like feature. It was really hard as, for us to identify what was the uh, real element or nature of the sources, but uh, this this result is uh, really important in the sense that uh, NICER has capability to detect uh, the spectral features or signatures from the burst. So if we are able to detect the ages and the spec their variation, how they are changing with the burst, uh, depending on the gravitational rate shift, we can determine the uh, the compactness ratio of the object and the ultimately the constraint on the neutron star radius. So, so this kind of study uh, really affect or really contribute towards the understanding on the neutron star radii. So uh, this is one of the source. I, I believe that Tolga will be discussing more about the source for you 1608. Uh, and in this uh, source, we detected a burst and from this burst, we found that uh, this is not a single peak burst as I showed earlier. There is something, another peculiar feature is coming in the secondary kind of peak like a structure in the decay tail of the burst. So we did the spectroscopy, we, uh, we checked it very carefully and we found that uh, uh, actually this is a genuine peak and which is, which is coming from this source. So I, I believe that uh, Tolga will be talking about more on these kind of structures or burst maybe in the next talk. So by still the result was in, in this paper uh, where I laid it, uh, the result was uh, still inconclusive that uh, why we see these two peak like a structure from uh, the secondary peak from this burst. And uh, the, there were different uh, multiple uh, a physical explanation for this. And I personally prefer the one of uh, the explanation uh, where we expect that uh, these, the, the somehow that there is some material left over during the first uh, thermonuclear burning process and this material again reignite. And because of the reburning of the material left over material, we see the rise uh, in the burst and this contribute to the two, two peak like structures uh, from these burst sources. So uh, this was a little bit on the low mass X-ray binary sources, especially towards the uh, X-ray burst, how we can use the X-ray burst for uh, constraining or contributing towards the neutron star radii. Uh, the one of the aspect with uh, NICER is that we, uh, we also observed the pulsating neutron stars and then uh, uh, especially uh, millisecond neutron stars and, and then uh, X-ray pulsars, it means that uh, the longer period pulsars. So I will be talking about the X-ray pulsars, which have the longer period means more than 10 seconds to thousands of seconds. And these kind of pulsars are usually found in high mass X-ray binary systems. As I described earlier that uh, in X-ray binary, we have, apart from the compact object, which is the neutron star here, I'm talking about the neutron star, neutron star X-ray binary. Apart from the compact object, the com depending on the companion mass, we can divide the low mass and high mass X-ray binary. So these X-ray pulsars mostly found in the high mass X-ray binary systems. Uh, and these are high, then that's why we call them high mass X-ray binary pulsars. Uh, these pulsars have the longer period, means they are the longer period pulsars. So they are nothing but they are rotating neutron stars and, and these neutron stars have a very high magnetic field. High magnetic field means uh, they have a magnetic field order of 10 to power 12 burst. Irrespective of the accretion mechanism, whether uh, this accretion comes from the disk, it happens through the disk or the, through the steeler wind accretion, 
uh, the material when it reaches toward the neutron star, uh, there, then there is an interaction between the neutron star magnetic field and the material ram pressure becomes very effective at that point. And when the material uh, ram pressure and the magnetic pressures are in the equilibrium, uh, that point we define the alpha radius or magnetosphere radius. And beyond this point means the particle cannot probe or go directly towards the neutron star. So they are forced to follow the magnetic field lines. So uh, here in the case of like high mass excited pulsars, we have very high magnetic field. So the magnetospheric radii means where the particle pressure and the magnetic pressure are in the balance. This comes towards the, at the very larger distances, let's say, uh, thousands of kilometers in the systems. So from there, the, the particles are, as you can see the one of the cartoon that uh, from there, the particles are forced to follow the magnetic field line and they form a narrow channel and go dumped onto the neutron star poles. So during this process means the material there, the plasma particle is starting from the thousand kilometer far away and then moving towards the close to the neutron star surface. Uh, in this process, the plasma particles, they attain the almost relative stick velocity, means the 10, uh, let's say 0.5 C up to relative stick. Uh, so you can imagine that, uh, that the tremendous kinetic energy in this case, means the plasma particles are carrying the too, many, uh, too much kinetic energy, and they are going on to, towards the neutron star, neutron star surface. And this neutron star surface is kind of incompressible. So when the plasma particle dumps onto the neutron star pole, they create, they transfer their kinetic energy onto the pole, and this becomes a black body like a structure, means there is a hot spot on the surface. And when the neutron star rotates, if this hot spot comes across the observable line, line of sight, we see the pulsation from the sources. And usually uh, these kind of pulsar have the pulsation period more than 10 seconds to thousands of seconds. So they rotate quite slow in that aspect of the millisecond pulsars. Uh, here, the material which comes onto the neutron star surface is formed like a column, like a structure. And uh, as you can see the one of the cartoon uh, in on the slide uh, below, uh, at the hot spot, we, we get a pure black body emission, but, but as we move above in the column, uh, the computerization process happens. These soft black body photons interact with uh, uh, the incoming relativistic electrons and they computerize and they give us to the broad back X-ray spectrum. So from the creating X-ray pulsars, we see quite broad band spectrum in the sense like uh, starting from, uh, uh, let's say 0.5 keV to hundreds of kilo electron volt. And uh, if this emission could be the continuum spectral emission, which is the mixture of black body emission plus something because of inverse computerization. So we get a, a composite spectrum, which in the hard X-ray, it uh, turns out to be power law kind of spectrum. And then the soft X-ray is a mixture of black body. So there are different spectral uh, components, means uh, something uh, because of Brahma Strolanga and other components. So we get a quite broad band spectrum here, but mainly because of computerization process. So uh, on top of when we observe the sources in X-ray, uh, we see a continuum spectrum. On top of it, we see the line of sight absorption. And then there are two interesting features, which is something emission-like features and absorption-like features are observed from the sources. These emission-like features comes from the fluorescence activity of the material means uh, this iron emission like features are usually observed from the high mass X-ray binary sources. But sometimes we also observe the rare features which is turns out to be cyclotron resonance scattering features. These features, the cyclotron scattering features are uh, really important uh, from high mass X-ray binary sources for constraining the magnetic field of these sources. Uh, suppose if we detect a broad uh, absorption like feature close to 12 kV, we can say that uh, this uh, magnetic field is close to 10 or oh, 10 to power 12 Gauss. It's a simple 12 B12 rule. And it's, uh, it can be uh, easily calculated just by uh, assuming the quantization of the energy level in the magnetic field. 
so, uh, the LARMA radii. So I will be talking about a little bit about the uh, case study of the source. It's a Swift J0243. It's a high mass X-ray band pulsar, which got discovered in 2017 with Swift satellite. And uh, it went into a giant outburst. Usually the sources show the outburst, which lasts for a week or a couple of weeks, uh, maybe month, but uh, the giant outburst from this source, that's why the giant outburst from the source lasted for the five months. About five months, we, we uh, saw the source active in the X-ray. And uh, we observed the source with an ISAP. We followed from the very beginning uh, of the outburst. In the nicer band, if I mention that how bright the source was, it started from the sum number, but it went up to 70,000 counts in the nicer band. So it was too bright. Uh, in astronomy, uh, maybe in extra astronomy, we uh, always refer to a label like we have a calibration source which is called the crab so we have with respect to the crab if we measure the uh, how bright the source was so it was the seven to eight crab uh, in the nicer band uh, in the nicer band the crab correspond to do around eleven thousand counts so the source was six to seven crab in the nicer band and it was too uh, bright source so with with the early studies using the new star and and other satellite, the Fermi GVM, we uh, suggested that uh, uh, the pulsation period of this source is 9.8 seconds. And then this, as I mentioned, that this source was too bright, means it reached the super Eddington luminosity, means it was accreting above then 10 to the power 38 arc per second at the peak of the outburst. So that makes it. Uh, a very interesting source to study and further follow up. So this is the image, like for example, with the nicer, uh, we observed the source and the, the saw that uh, the pulse profile of this pulsar is changing uh, with luminosity, means as the source luminosity, means as the mass accretion rate is getting changed, the beam emission means the, the whether it's a coming from the accretion column or something on the hot spot or something much more complicated happening. Uh, we saw that uh, these emission are getting changed or getting, uh, it's uh, mainly depending on the luminosity. We saw that there is something main, one peak like a structure with some moderate peak and then it's evolving into the double peak to like a structure or there is, uh, there is a changing of a single peak to multiple peak uh, in this source. So, uh, because of this source had a very high luminosity, which was more than 10 to the power 38 uh, per second, it was almost at the peak of the outburst, it was almost close to the uh, 10 to the power 39, 2 into 10 to the power 39 uh, per second. So this made it the ultra luminous X ray pulsars. Uh, we have uh, a class of ultra luminous sources, uh, which are mostly outside of our galaxy. We have detected this ultra luminous kind of sources. Uh, and uh, earlier, the idea was that uh, uh, these sources are maybe the intermediate black hole where the accretion is happening and we are seeing this too high luminosity. But uh, after the detection of pulsars from these sources, we came to know that, okay, pulsars are also the part of the ultra luminous family. So uh, the right now, the most idea is inclined towards the uh, neutron start populating the ultra luminous sources. So this is the one of the example where uh, we found the very first source in our galaxy, uh, which we called it ultra luminous X-ray pulsar uh, because of this very high luminosity at the outburst peak. So uh, if I just mention that uh, this source was uh, interesting in many aspects, and uh, uh, we saw that a very nice, pulse profile evolution from this source. Uh, there was a study which also found that from this source, they detected a radio jet. And uh, again, from till now, uh, no X-ray binary source, no X-ray binary source in the means, the high mass X-ray binary source have soaked the radio jets. And this was the one of the source where uh, the, the discovery of jet happened. Uh, the study suggested that, uh, uh, 
this jet are possibly if uh, the jets are observed from the low mass only the low magnetized sources uh, in the means the neutron star have the magnetic field of 10 to the power 8 curves but how it's possible that a high magnetized neutron star which is more than 10 to the power 12 gauss or 13 uh, 10 to the power 13 gauss could emit such kind of radio jets so here is just a, a mo movie that how the sources uh, look like this this high mass exoplanet sources so for example as i told that there is a donor star which is high mass uh, more than 10 solar mass and uh, there is a neutron star which is orbiting around the sources uh, this this donor star have their stellar wind or maybe there are a special class of sources which is called b exobinary which is a subclass of the high mass exobinary sources they also supposed to have the one of the equatorial disk so irrespective of what is the mass accretion, whether it's coming from the uh, wind accretion or whether it's coming from the disk accretion, uh, when the material reaches towards the neutron star, uh, it cannot fall directly onto the neutron star surface because of the angular, angular momentum it got from the companion star. The things get more complicated when we put the magnetic field and then you can see that uh, the materials are approaching to the neutron stars and we are seeing the pulsation and this was the video was made regarding the jet means so we also see from the highly magnetized sources we can see a jet so uh, that that is the summarized like how the jet was observed from the source or where it can come from from this this uh, cartoon or this video it was uh, from this study that so it, has, it is coming from this neutron star uh, but we we also observed the source with the NICER and got some quite uh, interesting result. In terms of timing, we saw the pulse profile evolution, quite marvelous pulse profile evolution. Uh, but in the spectral side, there was something more to add. Uh, something more to add in the means that uh, uh, depending on the source luminosity, we saw saw the different line components. For example, at the very uh, bottom of this figure, you can see that at the luminosity in the unit of 10 to the power 37, below 10 to the power 37 uh, erg uh, per second, we see the single line mainly from the 6.4 kV RL line. But as the source luminosity increases, we can see that the two lines are coming into the picture, which is 6.4 and 6.7 kV uh, iron fluorescence line. And then when the more luminosity increases, it's a beyond in the super Eddington region. It means the 1.8 into 10 to the power 38 out per second. We see about the third line, but on top of that, there is something interesting happening on the line profile. Usually, from this high mass exobinary sources, they are observed. They are supposed to be very single and narrow line profile, but here we see something a very broad, screwed profile. So means that there is something happening. There's something going on. Uh, we tried to probe it further out and then we um, found out that this uh, uh, line, lum the flux luminosity and the source luminosity are correlated in the means that uh, uh, this, uh, the, the line region is there somewhere close to the next to the neutron star or somewhere close to the neutron star. So how a broad line could originate from a high mass neutron star. Uh, so this is uh, the mm, this is the one of the study which suggests that when we have uh, only the Newtonian picture, we can see that the line profile that very symmetric lines uh, from from a source. But uh, if we just make it a little bit complicated by putting the special relativity, this makes the the Doppler beaming effect. It just a little bit screw the profile. But when we again add the general relativity picture, then this because of gravitational rate shift, the overall line profile becomes totally screwed up. And we see a very broad profile starting, uh, starting from 4 kV to 7 or 8 kV. This is usually observed in case of black hole binary sources where uh, the line emitting region reaches very close to the neutron star and where the gravitational field means the general relativity comes into the picture. So there is something is happening, maybe something similar is happening in this case. And uh, 
if it will be uh, sorry to interrupt, but you have just two minutes. Okay, yeah, sure. I will summarize that. Okay. okay. So, uh, in this source, if we just close, uh, try to see that how the magnetospheric radius is changing with the mass accretion rate. Uh, for example, this is a picture like uh, uh, how big the magnetosphere of the neutron star could be depending on on uh, the luminosity. We can see that if the neutron star has a magnetic field of uh, 10 to the power 13 Gauss, uh, depending on the luminosity at uh, let's say 1 to the power 10 to the power 38 Gauss, uh, sorry, depending on the luminosity 10 to the power 38 arc per second, we observe uh, a magnetospheric radii of around 10,000 kilometers. It means that the magnetospheric radius is too broad, or means the it's a it's a too uh, large from the neutron star surface. In that situation, we cannot observe if the line emission is coming from the accretion disk, then the disk would not reach very close to the neutron star and we cannot expect the very broad arrow line. So if we try to calculate the back, what could be the neutron star radii, if we assume, if, we, if our first assumption that this iron lines are coming from the disk, if this disk is reaching close to the neutron star surface. So in that situation, we can determine back to the magnetic field. So, so for relativistic effect on the line, we can expect that if, if the line is located close to uh, 10 kilometer to 200 kilometer, we can see the screw line. And just this, based on this figure, we determine that uh, there is a very tiny narrow possibility close to 10 to the power 11 Gauss, where we can see the line is coming uh, from accretion disk, and and this makes then again this falls this neutron star into the weakly magnetized neutron stars. So I will just conclude uh, my uh, talk here. I will just say the take home message is that uh, NICER is a marvelous soft X-ray instrument. It is attached to the ISIS. It is dedicated for neutron star studies. We are observing different kind of transient sources. Uh, the important result is that we have also observed the spectral feature from a burst and then uh, a, a broad arrow line from the high mass X-ray binary pulsar. There are more results to discuss, but I will be concluding my talk here. Thanks. Dr. Jaiswal, thank you for your talk. And I see no question in the chat panel. Therefore, I would like to move to the next speaker.